Hello, everyone. Thanks for being with us today. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History's Lunch Program. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube, where these videos are available to watch anytime afterwards. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Our new temporary exhibit of rarely shown state, national, and military flags from the MDAH collection opens this Saturday, March 9th, upstairs in the FedEx Exhibition Hall. Admission to the exhibit is free, and on Thursday, March 14th, there will be a gallery talk about the United States Colored Troops in Mississippi and the replica regimental flag of the 5th Heavy Artillery USCT that will be on display in that exhibit. And then join us at 2 p.m. this Sunday, March 10th, for our Sunday screening, uh, the documentary Master of Light, about the painter George Anthony Morton, whose time in prison shaped his artistry. We'll be joined by Chaplain Maurice Clifton and Allison Turner, who both do arts-related work with people incarcerated at Parchment. Should be a really good program. Finally, I hope that you'll join us next week for History's Lunch, when we'll, be, uh, when we'll feature Rochelle Putnam and Diane Williams, authors of the new book, Mississippi Museums, A History and Tour Guide. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Peter Adams to talk about Major General Edwin A. Walker, the subject of his new biography. Peter Adams is a senior lecturer in English at Old Dominion University. He earned his BA in communications from Fordham University and his MA in journalism from the University of Georgia. Adams's book, The Insurrectionist, Major General Edwin A. Walker and the Birth of the Deep State Conspiracy was published by LSU Press. His previous books include The Bowery Boys, Street Corner Radicals and the Politics of Rebellion, and Politics, Faith, and the Making of American Judaism. Help me welcome Peter Adams. Thank you very much. Uh, I've enjoyed coming here to Jackson, first time in Jackson. I was able to reconnect with an old friend. That was a, a surprise and, and a, a, great, a great part of this, uh, of this little journey here today. Uh, first, I'd like to extend my thanks to the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, and Chris Goodwin for inviting me here today to discuss the insurrectionist Major General Edwin A. Walker and the birth of the Deep State Conspiracy. I began this biography of Edwin Walker back in 2018 as we saw the rise of militant rightist extremism and a new and very frightening brand of conspiracy theories called QAnon. There were clearly parallels to similar phenomenon in the early 1960s with the fantasies of the John Birch Society, for example. Uh, Edwin Walker was a member of the John Birch Society. Uh, propagating the myth that a communist conspiracy was at every turn, even behind the fluoridation of water. Anticipating today's anti-vaxxers, one prominent John Birch Society leader said the Salk polio vaccine was a communist plot to weaken American youth. The 1960s, of course, we saw the activities of violent militia groups. Some of these militia groups in the early 1960s were progenitors of the uh, current militia movements that we see here in the late 20th century and early 21st century, such as the Minutemen and, of course, the Ku Klux Klan, which was quite active in the early 1960s. And Edwin Walker did have ties to the Minutemen, uh, as well as to Robert Shelton's United Clans of America. The rise of the extreme right during this period was, from what I have researched and understood, and what many people have researched and understood, was that it was a reaction to both the dismantling of the Crow, uh, Jim Crow system in the, in the southern states, as well as the anxieties of the Cold War. These were two very different problems in American culture and American society, but they were interrelated in the fact that they did produce a tremendous degree of dislocation uh, cultural dislocation, intellectual dislocation at this time. Uh, and the extremism we see today, like the extremism that underpinned uh, General Edwin Walker's belief system, is also a reaction to demographic, social, and cultural change that we're seeing today in the first couple of decades of the 21st century. Hannah Arendt 
in her Origins of Totalitarianism, I think expressed it best. She said, let me quote, those who have been uprooted from a stable world through abrupt social or economic dislocation are prime candidates for authoritarian movements. We saw that in the early 1960s, we saw that in the 1920s, and we see that, I think, in the first couple of decades of the 21st century. Those who were the disaffected who followed Edwin Walker in 1960, 61, and 62, and many of those who swear allegiance to authoritarian figures today, are very similar. So we look at the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol. That also offers a very interesting parallel to Walker's career. Walker was arrested for leading a deadly riot at the University of Mississippi campus in the fall of 1962. Two people were killed, the campus was left smoldering in an attempt to deny James Meredith admission to Ole Miss as a first African-American student. Walker was charged with seditious conspiracy and insurrection against the authority of the United States, all violations of U.S. Title Code 18. In the case of the January 6th attack, more than 30 rioters also face charges under Title 18, as does the former president. And of course, as we know today, um, uh, Governor Haley has suspended her campaign, and Donald Trump is now the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party. So we're going to have a rerun of the 2020 election in 2024, most likely, between current President Biden and former President Trump. But to tell the whole story of Edwin Walker, which is why I'm here, I want to start at the beginning. Edwin Anderson Walker was born in Center Point, Texas in 1909. Graduated from West Point in 1931. And with the outbreak of World War II, Walker volunteered for the first Special Service Force, also known as the Devil's Brigade. They were an elite fighting force, which in many ways was a predecessor to the Green Berets. They were trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat, parachute jumping, sabotage, night operations. Uh, their first mission was to the island of Kiska uh, to push the Japanese out of the Aleutians. Uh, but by the time they got there, the Japanese had fled. However, Walker did lead a pre-dawn raid on German positions on several islands off the French Riviera in front of a massive Allied landing called Operation Dragoon. Walker also served in the Korean War and saw some of the heaviest fighting at Heartbreak Ridge. But it was the recall of Douglas MacArthur from Korea and the settlement of the war that truly radicalized Walker and in many ways radicalized those who formed the John Birch Society. To Walker, Truman, in league with the Kremlin and the United Nations, stabbed the nation in the back. It was all part of a vast conspiracy to enslave America under a one-world dictatorship. Eleanor Roosevelt, Truman, Dean Acheson, Doug Hadamerschult of the United Nations, Eisenhower, and of course Nikita Khrushchev were all in on the conspiracy. This line of thinking was likely behind the Army's decision to station General Walker at the military district of Arkansas. He, uh, the, the army understood that Walker was a, a bit unhinged and that his theories and ideas and beliefs were really in opposition to what official military and administration policy was. Uh, they felt that the, army, the Arkansas military district would be safely out of the way, but it wasn't. <laughs> uh, he was appointed to that position only two months prior to the Little Rock crisis. At Little Rock, Walker was ordered to protect the nine African-American children up the steps of previously segregated Central High School. This was the first test of Brown versus Board of Education. Walker commanded federalized National Guard troops and the 101st Airborne Division with the military efficiency of what he was, a two-star major general. Walker dutifully obeyed his orders from President Eisenhower even as he was on the receiving end of uh, attacks from some Southern politicians. Governor Orville Forbes of Arkansas 
accused Walker's soldiers of leering and entering the girls' locker room. Georgia Senator Richard Russell compared Walker's command of troops to Hitler's stormtroopers. President Eisenhower was enraged. Uh, the fact of the matter is, Walker did work with the NAACP and the Little Rock mayor to ensure the students' safety from a violent mob that converged on Central High School in Little Rock. The irony, though, of course, was that while Walker obeyed his orders from the commander-in-chief, he was a staunch segregationist. To him, integration was part of that worldwide communist plot hatched in Moscow and in that glass building in the sinful New York City called the United Nations. Walker soon submitted his resignation to the Army, but Army Secretary Wilbur Brucker sent him to lead the 24th Infantry Division at Augsburg, Germany. The message was clear from the Army. If you really want to fight communism, go to the front lines in Europe. But once in Augsburg, Walker again ran into big trouble. Uh, Walker was accused of violating military policy. He was indoctrinating his soldiers with the conspiracy theories of the John Birch Society. Uh, he was admonished and demoted from a, essentially from a two-star general to the position of a colonel. Uh, it was a, uh, a real, a real humi humiliation for uh, Edwin Walker. And so he said, I'm going to resign. So he resigned from the army. He didn't retire from the army. He resigned from the army so he wouldn't get his pension. But he said, now I am free from the power of little men. Walker was now emerging, of course, as a celebrity of the radical right. He made it to the cover of Newsweek with the headline, Thunder on the Right. Uh, his notoriety was enough to concern President Kennedy. JFK encouraged John Frankenheimer, the uh, movie director, to adapt the 1962 novel Seven Days in May to the, to the screen. It starred Burt Lancaster, who played an army general intent on overthrowing the, the government, and that fictional general was based on Edwin Walker. With his newfound prominence among the ultra-right, Walker took his message on the road. And he did fill auditoriums from Dallas to Los Angeles. Before the term fake news, Walker alleged that the nation's news media was hiding the truth of Soviet infiltration in every corner of our lives. He warned to thunderous applause, quote, America would soon be overrun by Chinese and African soldiers in UN uniforms poised at the Mexican border. It is notable, of course, that the Army's case against Walker resulted in a series of hearings on Capitol Hill in late 1961 and early 1962. The question was, was Edwin Walker the only high-ranking officer who flouted official US policy? Senator Strom Thurmond of South Carolina, General Walker was, quote, crucified for his patriotism and was, quote, muzzled by the army. Now, on the other hand, Senator William Fulbright of Arkansas compared Walker and others like him to the French army generals uh, who plotted to overthrow Charles de Gaulle for the loss of the war in Algeria. Fulbright also pointed to a series of lectures at naval air stations under the name Project Alert, among the recommendations, a first nuclear strike against the Soviet Union. That was certainly against official U.S. policy. Uh, and Walker, but Walker, too, thought it was a great idea to hit Moscow first with nuclear weapons. Appeasers in the government, he said, have, quote, magnified the hazards of radiation. In testimony before Congress, Walker claimed that the deep state inside the army was behind silencing his warnings against the One World Conspiracy. To those who watched him before the congressional panel, Walker seemed out of touch with reality. Uh, Cecil Holland, a columnist with the Washington Star, uh, asked, is this the American general who could go haywire and start a nuclear war? Despite his bizarre behavior and outlandish theories, Walker ventured into politics. Uh, in the spring of 62, he ran for Texas governor uh, in the Democratic primary. The basis of his campaign was quite simple. As Texas governor, he was the best suited to ensure the border was safe from UN helicopters. 
It was not a winning strategy. Uh, he actually came in last in the primary. But of critical importance to this biography were the events surrounding the riot on the campus of the University of Mississippi in the fall of 1962. As I mentioned, it left, uh, let's see where I am here, yeah, good. As I mentioned, it left two dead and took two days to restore order with the U.S. Army and federalized Nas National Guard troops. Historian James Silver of the University of Mississippi, one of the most prominent history professors uh, in the United States, noted that at the time, Mississippi, Mississippi was, quote, a closed society. Silva wrote, the state was as near to approximating a police state anything we have yet seen in America. Months before James Meredith was escorted to the registrar's office, Walker was calling on his supporters to converge on the campus. As early as December 1961, as Meredith's case was running its course through the courts, Walker was here in Jackson. He was greeted at the airport by Governor Ross Barnett and Congressman John Bell Williams. That evening, before more than 3,500, Walker called for pre preserving segregation in the state of Mississippi. This is what he said. The state's determination to defend its sovereignty was because, quote, few states have as high a percentage of men and women who know how to use firearms, end of quote. Clearly, a call to violence. Further, he said, quote, I came here to meet the com communists on the battlefield, right here in Mississippi. We are at war, man your weapons and attack. In the days leading to the confrontation on the university campus, Walker was interviewed on radio programs in Shreveport and Dallas. It's time to rise, to make a stand beside Governor Ross Barnett, he said. Bring your flag, your tent, and your skillet. In Walker's mind, and, and, and you know, a lot of this was a psychological study of a man who uh, lived in a fantasy world uh, and lived in a world so detached from reality. Um, in his mind, thousands of supporters were coming from all over the country. Uh, on their way to engage in his battle uh, on, the, on the campus of the University of Mississippi. When he was asked whether these volunteers should come to Oxford armed, Walker was very careful in his words. But the dog whistle was quite clear. He said, quote, I have stated that whatever is necessary to oppose Meredith's entry to the campus should be done, end of quote. We will move with the punches. In fact, one member of the Minutemen, on his way to Oxford, was arrested by Dallas police who discovered an arsenal in his uh, car trunk. And he told the police he was inspired to Walker's call to action. So by September 27, 1962, as the uh, school year was about to begin, and registration was about to begin, uh, the streets of Oxford and the campus were beginning to fill with angry crowds people coming from different parts of the country, heeding Walker's appeal and the appeal of others who uh, wanted to block Meredith's entrance to the campus. There were snipers rumored to be in place to assassinate Meredith. And the FBI at this time was tracking Walker's movements as he made his way to Oxford. The FBI, by the way, in, in, in my study, uh, had voluminous material on Walker. I mean, I went through about I would say, a thousand pages of FBI documents regarding Walker and his movements, not only in 1962, but in the years following, where he was con where the dossier was continued to be put together by, AJ, by J. Edgar Hoover and, and others. Um, so he arrived in town on September 29th, and by this time there were nearly 500 federal marshals deployed to the campus. And the army was positioned, at the Memphis Naval Air Station as a staging area in case Army troops were necessary. Um, in a statement to NBC later that day on the, on the uh, 29th, Walker compared the use of federal troops to enforce the law to, quote, the crucifixion of Christ. In Walker's distorted view, the, quote, anti-Christ Supreme Court, and of course Earl Warren uh, in particular, were behind a conspiracy, a conspiracy of race mixing. Walker's long lawyer and longtime friend, General Clyde Watts, actually advised Walker not to go to Oxford in the first place 
And he told him that once you're in town, stay in your hotel room. Uh, Watts was alerted by friends in Washington uh, that Walker could be charged with sedition. But as usual, Walker refused to listen even to his closest advisors and even knowing that he was under FBI surveillance. FBI informants did warn that if Meredith was admitted to the university, um, sorry, yeah, I warned that if, if, if Meredith was admitted to the university, quote, Walker's followers will go underground to wage war against the federal government. Secretary of the Army Cyrus Vance ordered General Creighton Abrams, who was in charge of the troops on the ground, uh, to seize Walker if he had to. So Walker arrived on campus on the night of the 30th, about 9 o'clock in the evening. Uh, by this time, U.S. Marshals were on the defensive against rioters who were armed with bricks and Molotov cocktails and, 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 and pipes. And by this time, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Marshals were pushed into a defensive position. Walker took his position at the Confederate Monument, which was opposite the Lyceum on campus. As one correspondent poetically recalled, Walker's dark suit and white western hat gave off a ghostly glow in the gloom. Walker began urging a crowd of about 200 to keep up the confrontation with the marshals. A reporter with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch wrote, quote, when the word of Walker's identity spread, people moved toward him as if attracted by a magnet. At one point, Walker led the mob, now swelled to about 800, from the monument to the federal marsh, toward the federal marshals at the Lyceum. But they were repelled by a volley of tear gas. As students reported injuries, Walker pushed them, continued to push them to continue the assault on the federal marshals, um, saying, now you've got casualties. You're making news all over the country. James Jackson Kilpatrick of the... Uh, Richmond News leader described Walker as, quote, one of the strangest characters in this drama, flashing messianic fire from cold, fanatic eyes. As the fighting intensified through the night, Walker got into a very nasty exchange with Reverend Duncan Gray, rector of Oxford's St. Peter's Episcopal Church. Let's see here. Gray's appeal for peace ended with Walker saying, there is an Episcopal priest here who wants you to go home. Gray was pulled off the base of the monument and pinned to the ground, but luckily was rescued very, uh, within seconds. Um, Gray also, by the way, had served as the conduit between the Justice Department's uh, Civil Rights Division and Mississippi Univ uh, Ole Mrs. Uh, Chancellor. And only three months earlier, Gray had presided over the funeral of the great American writer William Faulkner. Through the night, Walker acted like a commander on the battlefield. He directed students to break into the power plant to shut the lights off. Um, he urged them to attack a fire truck. <laughs> but as the night wore on, Walker started to become a little bit more cautious. He realized that federal officials were watching. And he did, did dissuade one man from using his army sharpshooter skills to shoot the lights out of the marshal's vehicles. Um, but Walker was still the provocateur, was still directing the students to continue the fight on the campus, even though at this point, Two people had been killed. Um, a, a reporter for Agence France Press was shot, and a, a simple bystander was shot, uh, both men in their, in their 20s. Um, Walker said, as the, as the fighting war wore on, that he was ready to broadcast to the world. Um, he said, as soon as I get on the radio, I'll tell them what's going on here. President Kennedy, of course, was taking notice, as was uh, his brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. President Kennedy said, quote, General Walker, imagine that son of a bitch having been commander of a division up until last year and the Army promoting him. By 5 o'clock in the morning, October 1st, the university was under federal control. Meredith would be registered by 8 o'clock. Deputy Attorney General Nicholas Katzenbach issued an order to arrest Walker, identifying him as the leader of the insurrection. The Justice Department was particularly concerned about Walker's activities at about 2 o'clock in the morning on October 1st. He apparently drove to a, um, uh, a nearby Gulf gas station with a companion. He met with several other men, grabbed a case of empty soft drink bottles, filled a can with gasoline and drove off so you have an idea what, he's, what he <laughs> and, 
and his compatriots were up to. Uh, and later that morning in downtown Oxford, as he was coming out of his hotel room, uh, he encouraged rioters to attack National Guardsmen who were stationed in, this, in, the, in downtown. Um, quote, the crowd cheered him like a baseball hero after the home run that won the game. They followed him out of the square like the Pied Piper, according to Army Lieutenant Charles Shockley. Now, about 10 o'clock, Walker was heading out of town in his Chevrolet station wagon, but before he got more than three miles, he was stopped at an Army roadblock. Walker was to return to the Lyceum under an Army escort, then to the Federal Building, um, where he was formally charged with seditious conspiracy and inciting engaging in an insurrection against the authority of the United States government, as I mentioned, under U.S. Code Title 18. Walker did find defenders among the hardcore segregationists. Congressman Williams said Walker was protecting the university from federal occupation. He also accused federal marshals of, quote, needlessly beating citizens with rifle butts. An army investigation found no proof of that claim. There were also rumors that marshals had, of course, invaded the women's dormitory. Again, sounds just like what, the, what they were saying in, in Arkansas as well. Of course, not true. Um, however, Walker did receive no sympathy from former colleagues in the Pentagon. General Maxwell Taylor, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, made it clear that Walker no longer wore the uniform of the U.S. Army and should stand trial. Bail was set at $100,000, and Walker scrambled to uh, raise the money. Meanwhile, the director of the U.S. prisons in Washington, the Bureau of U.S. Pr uh, uh, prisons in Washington, concluded that there was no facility suitable to hold Walker in Mississippi, and that he should be sent to the medical center for federal prisoners in Springfield, Missouri. With a psychiatric hospital as well. Um, Clyde Watts, who is a gentleman there, who is a, a Walker's lawyer and longtime friend going all the way back to uh, West Point, um, objected. He said neither he nor Walker were present at the court hearing that ordered him committed to the federal prison for psychiatric uh, prisoners. Interestingly, the ACLU cried foul. The AMA received more than 2,000 letters questioning the government's decision to commit Walker. U.S. Attorney H.M. Ray said someone of Walker's stature in the armed forces who was charged with sedition could well be insane or certainly not competent to stand trial. To the ultra-right, however, this was one more example of the deep state conspiracy to send political prisoners to gulags already under construction in Alaska. It was the John Birch Society uh, uh, belief that the government was secretly building these prisons in Alaska for political enemies. Uh, <clears throat> Let me see. Okay. Now, on the floor of the House of Representatives, um, Texas Congressman uh, Bruce Alger said Walker's mother, Charlotte, warned him, quote, of a deliberate conspiracy to silence him. Alger accused Attorney General Robert Kennedy of censoring Walker's side of the story about events at Ole Miss. The John Birch Society weaved its own conspiracy theory that the Kennedys were part of a scheme to, quote, dominate the psychiatric profession, to gain co coercive control over those who oppose communism. Letters to FBI officers cl claimed that the government was intent on tampering with Walker's mind and body and possibly subjecting him to a lobotomy or drugs. In Walker's imagination, his confinement was an attempt to brainwash him to accept racial integration, saying, quote, I had Bobby Kennedy's indoctrination course in six days, and it didn't take. Walker and the Birches also, also saw conspiratorial brainwashing in every, in ev at every turn. Even the lyrics of the Beatles had a, quote, hypnotic effect on America's youth, making them vulnerable to the evil designs of Moscow and the United Nations. On October 6th, Walker's uh, bail was reduced uh, to 100, from $100,000 to $50,000. His family put up the money, and he was released that night. But in return for his freedom, Walker agreed to report for a psychiatric examination to determine if he was competent to stand trial for his participation in the Ole Miss riot. On November 8th, Walker entered Parkland Hospital in Dallas for two days of comprehensive physical and psychiatric exams. They found Walker, quote, functioning at the superior level of intelligence and described him as, quote, friendly, alert, and cooperative. The conclusion was that Walker was indeed competent to stand trial. 
but a grand jury in Oxford failed to return an indictment, which was not surprising. Walker did not go to trial and left for a free man heading back to his home in Dallas. And yet another strange twist, and there are a number of strange twists to this story that I haven't got to yet, but in, in, a, in yet another strange twist to this story, on his way back to Dallas, he helped rescue a, fire, a home on fire near Gainesville, Texas. He assisted firefighters in carrying out furniture um, and personal belongings. Uh, just two days after he walked free from the courthouse, Walker received a call from Billy James Hargis. Uh, we see him there, the popular preacher who founded the Christian Crusade. Hargis and Walker took a 27-city tour they called Midnight Ride. It was truly an odd couple, to say the least. Hargis was a powerful speaker, you know, a longtime preacher, good speaker. Walker, who never really expressed much about his Christian faith, was oftentimes incoherent. He uh, was a terrible speaker. Uh, in Birmingham, uh, they were given the keys to the city by Mayor Arthur Haynes. Hargis stepped to the podium in Indianapolis to counter protesters who had signs that read General Walker aided and embedded violence in Oxford. To Hargis, Walker was a victim of a Kennedy scheme to imprison political enemies. Walker also took Midnight Ride Tour as an opportunity to praise the old Miss Rioters on campus. He said he was impressed by students who found ways to, quote, protect the occupation of their campus by federal troops. An interesting part of the story of Walker at Old Miss also was his subsequent libel suit against the Associated Press. This resulted in a landmark press freedom case that went all the way to the US Supreme Court. Walker sued the Associated Press for its reporting of his participation in the riot. Fifteen other news organizations were also named in the suit for carrying the Associated Press dispatches. Walker said the news articles of a young reporter by the name of Van Savell unfairly labeled him the leader of the violence on campus. Savell, like Time magazine and CBS reporting from Oxford, was one of the hidden communist adversaries using psychological warfare to frame General Edwin A. Walker. Clyde Watts told jurors that Walker was on the university campus only as an observer. Walker, he said, feared that sending troops to Ole Miss to enforce the law would leave the country open to a Cuban invasion. Walker's suit against the AP won him a half million dollar award in Texas courts. It went all the way up to the Texas Supreme Court. But of course the Associated Press appealed and it went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. The US Supreme Court ruled that a victory for Walker would hamper media coverage of fast developing news stories such as the riot at Ole Miss. Justice John Harlan found Walker's radio interviews a call for violent vocal protest. And so the Supreme Court overturned his half million dollar award. Now this is a landmark case for several reasons. It's a landmark case because it established that a public figure like a General Edwin Walker would have the same rigorous burden of proof as any elected official to claim defamation. This was an extension of an earlier decision by the Supreme Court called New York Times versus Sullivan. Now, in New York Times versus Sullivan, that decision gave the press greater protection from unfounded defamation suits when reporting on elected officials. So now this extended New York, uh, New York Times versus Sullivan to also apply to any public figure as well. So this is why this became a landmark case in the, U in the US Supreme Court. Walker also lost a libel suit against Hodding Carter, junior editor of the Mississippi Delta Democrat Times. Um, now, Walker's actions at Ole Miss, and we talk, continue to talk about the media, um, you know, that, that, there's Hodding Carter and there's uh, uh, Justice Harlan over there. Um, I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, Walker's actions at Ole Miss did make headlines in Europe. Uh, especially among the left-leaning press. Uh, the newspaper Combat, which was at one time edited by Albert Camus, uh, praised Kennedy for, quote, routing the fascist clique howling around Barnett and Walker. The Cuban press referred to Walker as the head of a bunch of hoodlums. This book, by the way, explores one other strange facet 
of the Walker story. In April 1963, as Edwin Walker was sitting at home, a bullet shattered a window, missing his head by only a few inches. The would-be killer was that man, Lee Harvey Oswald, who would assassinate the president six months later. It was not until after the Kennedy assassination that Oswald was tied to the attempt to kill Edwin A. Walker. Upon questioning by the FBI, Marina Oswald, Oswald's Russian-born wife, confirmed her husband was indeed the shooter. This famous fold, uh, photo of Oswald holding his rifle, by the way, a, a, a rifle he bought, a, a mail-order rifle for, uh, I think it was under $30, uh, ordered from Klein Sporting Goods in Chicago. Uh, it was an Italian-made rifle. Um, this was the rifle that he fired the shot uh, through Walker's window and was also the same shot, uh, rifle that he used to assassinate the president. Um, now, there were those who believed that Walker was leading the conspiracy to assassinate JFK and that Oswald's failed attempt to kill Walker was a diversion. That theory was debunked by the Warren Commission. Uh, and the Warren Commission basically concluded that um, the attempt to assassinate Edwin Walker was not related in any way to Oswald's assassination of the president. Um, but it was believable at the time because of Adlai Stevenson's reception in Dallas just a month before the president was murdered. Here again, we encounter Edwin Walker as provocateur. UN Ambassador Stevenson was in Dallas for a United Nations Day event. And to Walker and the Birchers, the UN was a tool of the Kremlin and traitors in the Kennedy administration. Even UNICEF pennies collected um, uh, by children on Halloween went directly into the pockets of Fidel Castro. Um, so the day before Stevenson's arrival, Walker led a raucous rally calling for protests. By the way, Oswald attended that rally. He was in the audience. Uh, all kinds of interesting <laughs> uh, uh, coincidences here. Um, Stevenson was jeered, spat upon, physically attacked by signs, uh, picket signs, that were stored in Walker's home. Uh, so he, Walker basically was one of the leaders of this attack, uh, and this attack on uh, Adlai Stevenson, who, as you know, ran for president in 1952 and 1956, and was Kennedy's uh, UN ambassador. Uh, consequently, Stevenson returned to Washington and warned uh, Rob, uh, 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 Robert Kennedy that uh, maybe the president should skip his Dallas visit. It was a dangerous place to go. My final chapters in this story um, look at Walker's descent into the furthest fringes of the radical right. In the years after the riot at Ole Miss, he continued his war against the civil rights movement. On the 10th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Ed, Walker was invited to Little Rock by the Citizens Council. The talk was billed as, quote, an American soldier's battle with the world police state. Walker was also lauded by the neo-Nazi National States Rights Party. And Walker joined white supremacists in defending Byron de la Beckwith as he awaited trial for the murder of Medgar Evers in early 1964. In fact, de la Beckwith had heeded Walker's call two years earlier to join the attack on the University of Mississippi. He was stopped by police on his way to Oxford from Greenwood and... Um, uh, uh, he had also, of course, had, had uh, armaments and, and uh, ammunition in his trunk as well. Added to that, Walker was offered the exalted title of Grand Dragon uh, for the Texas United Clans in 1965. That same year, Walker told a gathering in Florida that with the election of Lyndon Johnson, quote, you better keep your, the guns you have cleaned and oiled, you might need them. And, of course, the FBI concluded that Walker did provide tactical advice to the violent and well-armed militia group, the Minutemen. But, as I mentioned, Walker was always operating from behind the scenes, and there's a story behind that. There are several reasons for, for, for why he, he, he sort of uh, uh, operated behind the scenes. 
Um, one was he knew, always knew he was under FBI surveillance. He always knew the, F the FBI dossiers were very significant. The second thing is he wanted to project some kind of an image of some degree of respectability after being arrested at, at Ole Miss. And the third is he had a very deep, dark secret. In 1976 and in 1977, Walker was arrested for approaching a male vice officer in a Dallas Park restroom. Edwin Walker was a deeply closeted gay man, which, of course, in the Army at the time, be you know, this is, you know, in the 1960s in the Army, there was no um, uh, recourse for that. And, of course, within the, the far-right groups that he was associated with, that would have been a problem as well for him. Um, it was not the only such arrest in 1976, by the way, of a prominent official for so-called lewd behavior. G. Harold Carswell, which you see up the top of the screen, was Nixon's Supreme Court nominee who was rejected by the Senate. And that same year, he made sexual advances to a male vice officer in a Tallahassee men's room and was arrested for that as well. There were whisperings long before about Walker's sexuality. Uh, it was, it was, for some people, it was not a surprise. Um, during the events at the University of Mississippi, the FBI, of course, tracked wherever he went, and one informant made the note of, quote, a youthful male assistant who refused to give his name and accompanied Walker to his Oxford hotel. Uh, this was coded language at the time for any, when any liaison between an older man and a younger man array suspicions in the FBI. Through the 1970s and 1980s, Edwin Walker's behavior and writings continued what really was a descent into madness. Uh, he, he wrote constant letters to FBI Director Hoover and U.S. Senators um, uh, that were ignored. Of course, ravings of, 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 of a madman. Uh, in one letter to the FBI, he wrote, Another Lee Harvey Oswald in the form of a soldier who has hijacked an airplane loaded with bombs which could be used to overthrow the U.S. Senate Capitol. This was very typical of his writings. They were incoherent. I, I, uh, University of Texas has his papers, and I would get um, uh, copies of his, um, his writings, uh, some of them handwritten. None of them made sense at, at this point in time. Um, Walker was also financially strapped at this point. Um, he was trying to make a few dollars for some dwindling speaking tours. His Dallas home fell into disrepair. He had to move to more modest quarters. Um, the Washington Post columnist Chalmers Roberts was grateful that Walker did not have the mental dexterity to be a dictator in waiting. Edwin Walker died on Halloween in 1993, practically forgotten. In a final interview shortly before his death, Walker, of course, remained an unrepentant segregationist. According to the interview, Walker, quote, mumbled gibberish, particularly when he spoke of his historical legacy. In his mind, he was still a warrior. Rescuing Edwin Walker from obscurity gained relevance for me with the January 6, 2021 attack on the Capitol and with the emergency of conspiracy theories and political extremes. There are ominous parallels. Let me give you an example. In 1961, the journalist Alan Barth predicted that Walker's followers would, quote, seek to capture control of the Republican Party. But Barth held out hope that genuine conservatives would, quote, not forsake the traditions of their party for a forlorn kind of fascism. I want to conclude with a bit of a postscript regarding the Kennedy uh, assassination and Edmund Walker. I believe that had Oswald been successful in killing Walker that night in April 1963, he would either have been apprehended or possibly been satisfied that he fulfilled his twisted desire to be an assassin. In either case, Kennedy might have left Dallas alive November 22nd, 1963. This is just speculation on my part. Declassified testimony from the CIA's chief of clandestine services in, Ma in Mexico as well as the assessment of the Warren Commission indicated that Oswald needed to prove a distorted perception of his place in history. Uh, Oswald had put together what he called an historic diary. Uh, he really truly believed that he had a place in history. Um, because Oswald was a failure in just about everything he did. 
Um, he told Marina that assassinating Walker would be heroic, and he compared it to killing Hitler before Hitler took power. So this, is where, this, is where I, this is where Lee Harvey Oswald saw his, his distorted place in, in history. Um, and that reasoning is consistent with what we know about psychopathic personalities, according to uh, this declassified CIA testimony. You can read the full text of my conclusions regarding this on the LSU uh, blog. Finally, I want to note the assistance uh, I received from my own institution, Old Dominion University, and the publisher of uh, The Insurrectionist, Louisiana State University Press, and the University of Texas, which houses uh, uh, the Walker Papers, and they were quite generous in supplying me with PDFs and, and other uh, materials that I needed, uh, especially during the COVID pandemic. I did a lot of this writing during, during the COVID pandemic. And uh, I thank you very much, and I await any of your questions. Okay, now you said the Warren Commission discounted any connection between him trying to, Lee Harvey Oswald trying to kill Edwin Walker and later killing Kennedy. Um, and I'm sure they did, but, and I know some of the finest men in the country were on the Warren Commission, but I still have a real skepticism about their findings, period. Oh, well, look, I, I, I do too. I, I do too. I mean, you know, I don't, th I don't think we're going to know the full truth about the Kennedy assassination until every single document, every single note has been declassified. Um, I have my own theories. I have my own uh, views on that, um, uh, but um, but clearly, the um, Walker, the, the uh, Oswald's attempt to kill Walker, and his assassination of the president. I agree with the Warren Commission here that they, that they were not connected. But I do agree with you in the fact that yes, I don't think we know everything, and I think it's going to take a long, long time before we do. I'm uh, curious about your assessment of the mental state of Walker and sort of how that progressed because he passed the mental examination uh, um, in, I think, Dallas, you said. And sort of, you know, do you see a pattern? Uh, you know, how does that sort of obsessive paranoia link to uh, politics? And what kind of warning is that for today? Well, uh, you know, I, I you know, he, 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 you know, certainly he was operating at a high level of intelligence, but I don't think that discounts the fact that uh, he was certainly had many, I, I, th I think, uh, uh, mental anxieties and mental problems. Uh, uh, and, and certainly as he got older and as he uh, became more uh, disconnected from reality, and as, he, and as he started to become, uh, ha have pro financial problems as well, uh, and certainly after his arrest uh, for lewd behavior, um, it just seemed that the man just spiraled way down. Um, the uh, paranoia in politics, well, <laughs> you know, it, it, you, know I, I, you know, it's not, you know, the one, you know I, I'm a great um, fan of Richard Hofstadter, the uh, historian who wrote, anti-intellectualism in, in political life, in American life, and he also wrote uh, The Paranoid Style of American Politics in 1964. Um, and what Hofstadter showed in The uh, Paranoid sti Style of American Politics was that throughout um, U.S. history, we have seen cycles of that. Uh, we saw it, for example, in the 1840s with the rise of the Know Nothing Party and the anti-Catholic uh, uh, paranoia that was going on at that period of time where there was a belief that uh, the Vatican was uh, uh, slowly trying to take over the United States. And um, uh, there was, an, of course, again, that uh, dovetailed with anti-immigrant sentiments that were very powerful in the 1840s, especially regarding to Catholics. We saw this again in the 1920s when, it, when there was a lot of um, anti-immigration sentiment against Jews uh, and against other people coming from different parts of Europe. So, you know, we see, unfortunately, throughout uh, U.S. history, 
because, of, because I think because of the size of the country, because of the demographic diversity of the country, because of our open borders for immigration that have, you know, have fueled uh, the, the, the greatness of this country, have also fueled, uh, um, unfortunately, a darker side as well. I've always wondered um, about the, the riots at Ole Miss. It's often said that, well, that, you know, General Walker came and brought followers or something. It, it, but it's often said that the students rioted. Is there any clear indication of who those people were that were rioting, you know, on that night? Not many were students. They, were, they came from the outside. These were outsiders that came in. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, uh, there was one uh, thing that I, re I read that said that by midnight, Pretty much, the students were off, were were out of the campus, or certainly out of, out of the out of the area where the lyceum was and where the where the fighting was, and it was all outsiders coming in, uh, uh, heavily armed. Uh, many of them were um, uh, mobilized by uh, Shelton's United Clans and other uh, extremist groups as well, and Minutemen. So yeah, I think a lot of what was happening there was the work of outsiders. Um, the Walker attack uh, at Ole Miss seems to be one that was racially motivated to, to, to preserve segregation. The insurrection in 2021, and I, 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 I think you're making a, 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 a parallel a comparison. Um, that was motivated by um, trying to overturn a democratically elected government. So to overturn that government uh, was for political purposes. Walker's purpose was for segregation. I'm trying to see what the connection well, the connection was that his actions against the federal marshals was an action against the U.S. government. So this is why both in, in the Capitol riot of 2021, where there were attacks on federal property and against federal officers, it applied the same way as when Walker attacked or, 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 or led the attack against federal marshals and U.S. Army troops. So in both cases, we have an attack on the U.S. government. One to, over, to overturn an election and one to prevent a young man from applying and registering at the university. But both were attacks against the, U, the, the authority of the U.S. government. horrible thing, but I was up there, up here in the grove that night, watching all that going on, and I don't know how this, I went on back to the Dimer Church, and I don't know how this lady got my name, but I got a phone call from this lady, and she was hysterical, hysterical. She couldn't get a hold of her son. Wow. So I went back down to the Lyceum, <coughs> and this FBI guy, he, he, he said, come on, I'll, uh, we'll see. And we walked down in the basement of the Lyceum, and I want to be honest with you, those were some of the roughest-looking people I've ever seen. Oh, I can imagine. They had them all laid out, all laid out on the floor yeah. with chains and handcuffs. That's the roughest bunch of people I've ever seen in my life, and I've seen some, I spent a while in Vietnam, I've seen some rough times. But Mississippi got a bad name for that, and I, I don't reckon we'll ever live it down, but there was a lot of other folks beside Mississippi people up there that Thank you. Very interesting. Hello. Are you suggesting that that there were no uh, University of Mississippi students participating in oh. this? Oh no, that, there that were the outsiders. That the people that were were only outside, so that came from outside of Mississippi. Oh no, 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 no. There were plenty of students involved. Uh, but I, I, I think that the overwhelming majority 
were outsiders. But yes, oh no, there were, there, there were students who were participating in this riot, absolutely. Um, and, um, and, 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 but, I, but I think those sort of leading the riot, those who were heavily armed, certainly came in from the outside. We have a question from the live stream. Diane Feldman asks, can you say more about the relationship between Walker and segregationists in Mississippi? It's not clear to me whether he instigated, advised, or simply joined the riot at Ole Miss. Uh, he instigated and uh, he, he mostly commanded and instigated. I, I, I would say that. He didn't necessarily, he, I, he, as far as I know, he didn't pick up any objects to throw. Um, he didn't uh, personally scuffle with anyone. But he told the students, like a commander in the battlefield, Go here, go there, uh, knock out this uh, light. Um, uh, you know, now is the time to push against the federal marshals. So he was acting more as the general uh, than, than as the soldier. But certainly, certainly, he was in charge of the crowd and was leading the crowd in every sense of the word. Thank you so much for this information. Uh, I've read... Uh, a lot about uh, the riot at Ole Miss. And one thing that always impressed me was Duncan Gray yeah. trying to um, take the bricks from the students and others. Uh, I was so moved by that early on. And uh, then to hear that he was pinned down and that kind of thing. But yeah. uh, um, that always impressed me a lot. But what I'm hearing and your your given me a very clear picture of the emotions and the, the anger that was present that night. It seems to me with that plus the abundance of weapons, it seems uh, a miracle almost that there were only two fatalities. Yeah. I know a lot of people were probably hit and, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, to what do you attribute that? Was it the presence of the heavily armed federal government or what? Mm -hmm. it, it just, uh, as I said, it seems miraculous that there were no more uh, deaths. I'm grateful. Yeah, I, I, you know, certainly it was ver very quickly uh, federalized National Guard troops made it o onto campus and uh, made it into the town of Oxford. And there's no question about it. Uh, the National Guard uh, and the federal marshals uh, bravely uh, kept uh, the, the, the uh, uh, restored order uh, by, by, uh, by uh, late, early morning of, the, of October 1st. But clearly, that, that was the, um, the, ro the role of the National Guard, and they, and they did a wonderful job, obviously, uh, to prevent more, more tragedies like that. Quick question uh, here uh, and a comment. Uh, to the two people that have commented on what was happening that day uh, up at Oxford, there is an excellent program on C-SPAN. Uh, it's about an hour and a half, and it, it goes all through that period of time, and it shows the chaos. And in, uh, secondly, there is another program uh, that is... Uh, when Robert Kennedy came after he left being attorney general and went to Ole Miss to give a talk on what happened when he was attorney general. That is an excellent program. And because, of course, of his assassination, we have lost a lot of history from what he would be able to, to say on so many issues. The, the question, sir, uh, is do you see any parallel uh, between General Walker and General Flynn? Uh, I, I was waiting for that question. Uh, I was waiting for that question. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Uh, I, I, I do. Um, General Flynn is a um, very interesting character. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I definitely do see that. I, I think that... Um, if um, he were, if General Flynn were to were to uh, uh, have any degree of power in this country, uh, I uh, don't think it would be a good thing. 
Uh, and and, and I, I think Flynn also, too, represents um, the, um, the, the furthest poles of extremism in, in, in this country. Yeah, no, there are, there, are, there are parallels. There's no question about that. And, you know, uh, when, when, the, um, when the hearings were going on in 1961 and 1962, um, Secretary uh, of Defense McNamara was uh, bringing up a number of different uh, high-ranking military um, uh, uh, officers who were indeed pushing conspiracy theories and pushing uh, ideas that were clearly not anywhere near official U.S policy, administration policy, or Defense Department policy, including Admiral Arleigh Burke, uh, and including um, uh, some other very high-ranking individuals in the Navy, and, in the, and especially in the Navy, uh, and, in, and in the U.S. Army, yeah. Oh, man. Thank you for... Oh, is there one question there? Oh, oh, well, we're going to let her ask it in the line to buy a book. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Because we got to the top of the hour. Um, Thank you all for being here. We do have copies of the book. If you didn't have a chance to answer your, to ask your question, I bet Peter will be happy to answer it uh, over here while he's signing a copy. Uh, come back Sunday for the screening. Come back next Wednesday for History's Lunch. When we'll look at museums and sites across the state. One more time, help me thank Peter Adams for this fantastic program today.